This is Brand USA Talks Travel, elevating the conversation about international travel to the United States. Here's your host, Mark Lapidus. At what age did you decide to become an entrepreneur? I was 26 and I've been traveling all my life and really focused on like backpacking dirt bag adventure travel for a solid (laughs) decade. When I had the idea for Matador, which was conceived on the top of or halfway up a volcano outside of Arequipa, Peru, a volcano called Vulcan Misty. And I was with four of my other dirtbag friends who we had traveling through South America. And we had tents, stoves. We were very focused on saving money and making the adventure last. So we were savoring tuna and crackers for lunch. And um, we were not hiring guides to climb these badass mountains and just climbing them alone. And we got on the top of this mountain or near the top and we're like, where do we share stories like this and photos like this? So this is like 2004. So that was the first inkling of the idea for Matador is this global community of storytellers around travel and adventure. And then came back, got a real job selling database software at a large software company and, of course, like hated it. And then someone came over to my cubicle and was like, yo, have you heard this new site, YouTube? And I'm like, no. And he's like, check it out, YouTube.com. People's videos are getting like 25,000 views. It's crazy. And so it's easy to forget how, you know, back in the early 2000s, you know, there were no blogs. There was Facebook was only for college kids with a .edu email address. And this whole like creator revolution was not even close to happening yet. So that was super exciting for me. And that I guess if there's a moment when I was like, I need to start a company, that was it. Because I wanted to be, you know, YouTube was crowdsourcing video for everything. I wanted to crowdsource travel storytelling. And so that's how it started. I'm sure that a lot of our listeners recognize the voice that I'm speaking with. My guest today is Ross Borden. Ross is the CEO of Matador Network. And my copy here says, Ross, that you founded Matador in 2006 with a budget of $11,000. Is that accurate? Correct. Yep. Amazing. Today, Matador is a leading digital media company focused on travel and adventure, reaching over 100 million people a month with videos, articles, city guides, and social content. A lot of people in the industry are already talking about Guide Geek Ross. Congratulations for being one of the first out of the gate with this product. Thank you. Yeah, we're extremely excited about it. In fact, I would say it's the most excited I've been about any product we've ever launched in our 16-year history. Well, that's saying a lot, actually, because you've launched a lot of products. We have, but this is, you know, if you think about travel has kind of been stuck in the dark ages since the mid 90s when the OTAs launched, where it was like revolutionary that you could go book your own flight in your own hotel. But since then, especially for research and booking, there's been close to zero innovation. Of course, how we get inspired by travel, that's been moved by social media. You watch videos on Instagram and TikTok, and maybe that will ignite a curiosity in you about that specific place. But what happens next is a long slog through reviews and Google searches and hard to find information. And so we think AI will welcome a new renaissance into how people plan, research, and book travel. And we're excited to be a leader already in the space. So give us the backstory on why you decided to take the plunge and develop it. Yeah, so we had kind of like early on access to the LLM that ChatGPT is based on. Most people think AI, they think ChatGPT. So we were, I think like most people are when they first played with ChatGPT, pretty blown away at its capabilities, its accuracy, its speed. But we had also been thinking about messaging, massive messaging platforms like WhatsApp. You know, not as big in the U.S., curiously, but when you travel abroad, you realize the whole world runs on WhatsApp and everyone is on WhatsApp to communicate with each other, to communicate with businesses. I mean, like I was in Bali with my family recently. We were just ordering takeout all through WhatsApp, like customer service, all kinds of stuff through WhatsApp. And then, of course, there's Facebook Messenger. There's the DMs on Instagram Messenger. These are platforms that are used by billions of people. And so we thought, what if we could plug the AI into these large platform messaging applications And it could be like a travel advisor in your pocket that gets to know you, gets to know what you like, what you dislike, 
what your travel budget is, what your home airport is. And so we started playing with it. But as you can imagine, when you just plug these things in, there were a lot of problems at first. And so for the last eight months, we've been fixing problems and figuring out different innovations on a custom software platform for GuideGeek, literally on a daily and weekly basis. And we've gotten it to a pretty exciting inflection point. We've updated a lot of the information that was out of date from just the normal LLM at OpenAI. And then we've added APIs like flights so we can search live flight data on GuideGeek and get, you know, bookable links sent to you instantly. It searches every airline, every OTA on the internet via our Skyscanner partnership. And next week, actually, we're launching hotels. So right now, GuideGeek will recommend hotels, but next week it will recommend hotels and will give you a link to go and book the hotel instantly. So yeah, we're excited about it. Incredible. Good for you. Curious as to whether or not you have partners or if you're on your own with GuideGeek. We're on our own. We're a profitable company. And so it's fun and exciting to be able to throw cash at things that you think have promise. And I mean, I guess one of the things that's great about the AI revolution is you don't like we didn't need to build our own language model, which would have taken hundreds of millions of dollars to do. You can tap into models like OpenAI. You can tap into APIs. But we have a really talented team. We have a dedicated team working on GuideGeek and it's 100 percent self-funded. For those who haven't used it yet, tell us how GuideGeek works. Sure. So it starts by just going to guidegeek.com and then you scan a QR code to actually connect with the AI. So you could scan a QR code to connect on Instagram or you could scan a different QR code to connect on WhatsApp. And then it's all on your phone. So there's actually no website other than the one where you're scanning those QR codes. And those QR codes will open either in the DMs on Instagram or a new conversation on WhatsApp. And then you basically just say hi. And you say, hey, Guy Geek, what can you do? And Guy Geek will tell you, here are the 10 major buckets of things I can help you with. I can help you find flights. I can help you find Airbnbs and vacation rentals. I can tell you the best times to visit, the best restaurants, the coolest places to check out on your travels. I can build custom itineraries based on your tastes and preferences. And so, you know, that's kind of a short list to get people going, to get their creative juices flowing and to begin asking questions. And then you can just chat with it like you're chatting with a friend. So say I'm going to Barcelona and my friend lives in Barcelona his whole life and he's just got the keys to the city and knows everything happening in Barcelona, best places to eat, stay, party, explore, see the art. I would just text with him, hey, what, I'm coming to Barcelona next week, what should we do? It's the same exact thing, except that friend not only knows Barcelona, it knows literally every city, every country, every little town on earth. It's read every single restaurant review, every hotel review, it's watched every video. And so it is an expert globally. Hopefully you're telling your friend about Los Angeles and not Barcelona. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's our mission, of course. What percentage of people are looking at things in the United States internationally? Can you tell? Yeah, I think it's less than 50%, but I think it's also the biggest chunk of any country. So more people are searching for information on U.S. destinations than any other country. And it's changing all the time. I mean, we've got tens of thousands of active users every month. We've got tens of thousands of new users every month. I haven't been following the exact stats, but the U.S. is a big deal on GuideGeek for sure. I think everybody realizes by now that these things work off of data sets. What are the data sets that you're using to feed into GuideGeek? So the main data set is OpenAI's language model, which is the one I was just talking about that's kind of swallowed up the entire internet up until September 2021. Then we've added a whole bunch of data because, of course, in 2021, the COVID pandemic was still raging. And so we don't want GuideGeek to tell people that they need a PCR test to visit the U.S. or whatever it is. So we've done a lot of updates. And I think one misconception, and you know, jury's out to see if we're right about this, but I think when ChatGPT launched, everyone thought about it as like, this is the new Google. Everyone's going to come here, ChatGPT, for everything and ask it any question and get the answer. And we actually think that it's the other way around. We think that the more exciting part of AI is the way that it can be customized. And so we think every brand and every DMO, since we're talking to you and Brand USA here for the podcast, every destination, every tourism board will want their own 
AI based around their brand, their sensitivities, their strengths and weaknesses, and ultimately have their own sort of personal AI for their DMO. And so that's what we're building with GuideGeek. We have what I call the GuideGeek Mothership, which is our large consumer facing platform to help people explore travel worldwide. And now we're working with leading global DMOs from the US and abroad to create customized AIs based on their destination, their data, their website, and their brand. I think increasingly right now, GuideGeek is mainly based on the major LLM of OpenAI. I think soon it will be based on that and the individual data of each DMO that we're working with. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. You mentioned Skyscanner before. Who else are you using to provide the information that's the backbone of the AI? Uh, I can't talk about that until we launch hotels, but a major meta search and OTA platform for hotels and then Skyscanner. And then, you know, we're adding weather, currency conversions, all kinds of things so that you have real time information, regardless of kind of what you're asking about. Anything that touches travel, we are integrating into our technology. As you and I have talked about, Ross, brand safety is a big deal with DMOs. How do you deal with that? What do you do when the AI starts to hallucinate or give the wrong answers? Yeah, I mean, I think those are two separate conversations. So let's talk about brand safety in general without the addition of hallucinations. And I'll define what hallucinations are in a minute for those who are not familiar. But brand safety, obviously a huge deal for any brand, any company, any organization, and DMOs are no exception. So ChatGPT and OpenAI, they have some brand safety features built in, but we've added a lot more. We want our AI to be safer. We don't want it to argue about politics. We don't want it to get into controversial subjects that something that you chat with ChatGPT might be absolutely welcoming you to chat with it about. So we've added a bunch of layers. And you can see this if you try to strike up conversations with GuideGeek that have profanity or you ask it about things that are inappropriate. So we've built in a lot of like classic brand safety measures. And GuideGeek will simply very politely shut you down. We'll say, I'm not going to make any recommendations on that. I wouldn't recommend doing that. But if you have any travel questions, you let me know. And more often than not, as you can imagine, when you launch a product like this, Mark, people try and test it. They try and get it to trip up. They try and get it to say something naughty. And it's funny because they get shut down and shut down and shut down. And finally, they're like, all right, help me plan this trip to Italy. They like kind of give up and start planning a real trip and using it for what it's actually designed to be used for. Hallucinations, I guess, could be considered also brand safety. Hallucinations are when the AI doesn't have an answer, and so it makes one up. Complete fiction. And that is obviously a shortcoming of AI as it stands right now. It's something that a lot of people are trying to work to fix. You're going to love the ocean views in Nebraska. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the evergreen stuff like that almost never happens. If you ask it about the history of an artist, you're in the middle of a museum. You're saying, I'm standing in front of this exhibit and this is the artist I'm looking at. Tell me about this person. Very low chance it's just going to start making up stories about that person because that's all in textbooks. That's kind of baked in history. It's more like if you say, hey, I'm looking for a fly shop for fly fishing in this tiny little town that maybe is not even really known for fly fishing. It might say like real fun anglers like R-E-E-L, like, you know, it will make something up. It's kind of like a witty thing where we who are you know maintaining and working with the AI, we wish it would just say, you know, I'm not finding any fly shops in that tiny little town, but instead sometimes it will just make something up. But we have figured out over the last couple of months how to drastically reduce the amount of times and the propensity of the AI to do that. So I can't share exactly what those tactics are, but we've gotten errors and just the AI getting stuck. When we started, we were about 15% of all conversations either had wrong information or the AI was getting tripped up in the conversation the way someone was asking about something wasn't really translating well to the AI and it was getting confused or it thought they were asking about something and they were asking about something else. Now those errors are well below 5%. So we've had huge gains in that arena. And now we think we can get below 2 to 3% by the end of the year. Honestly, I don't think we'll get any better than that. If we can get under 2%, I'll be thrilled. 
So 98 out of 100 people are having a flawless experience and getting accurate information. That would be mission accomplished for us. But the other thing that we have is we have humans. We've built on our software platform. We have the ability for humans to read the conversations and intervene if someone does get stuck or if they do get given the wrong information. And so we have sort of the AI taking the lead and then we have human oversight. And that's really helped us get those errors down from 15% to under five very quickly. The only way you can do it is have people reading the conversation. So my hat is off to this team of four people at Matador. They've literally read hundreds of thousands of conversations and helped us really improve the products to a very exciting juncture. And are they across a lot of time zones? Yeah, we got one in California, PST, one in New York, EST, one in Europe and Italy, and one in Asia. Do you see growing that team? Maybe a little bit. There's never going to be a point where we're going to have like a call center style, like 40 people reading conversations. I think we needed these critical four people to read those first, you know, hundreds of thousands of conversations to get errors down from 15% towards Towards, you know, five to two percent. Once we get there, I don't think we're going to need as many people. I think we'll keep the four because they're really good at what they do. And if they see a revenue opportunity for Matador, they can capitalize on that. They can train the DMOs that we're welcoming onto the platform, how to use it. And they can ultimately help us develop products and services on the platform that are more just generally useful to the users and useful to our clients who are utilizing our technology. But, you know, if we have millions and millions of users a year from now, we're not going to have like 80 agents. I'm curious as to what the agents are saying about consumers seeing wrong information and how they're reacting to that. Like, how does somebody typically react when they see something that they know isn't true? So one of the first features that we built into GuideGeek's software platform is human intervention. So the first thing they would do is they take over for the AI. They would acknowledge the mistake and say, you know what, sorry about that. Here's the correct information for what you were looking for. So to the user, it's still coming back as GuideGeek. It's not like, hey, I'm a human popping in here to fix an error. I think for some reason, weirdly, that would be like freaky for the users. But I mean, with what I know, what I've learned about AI over the last year, I do have macro concerns about how fast it's moving, you know, what could potentially go wrong. But I have to say that we think of travel as our pretty harmless little enclave of AI. There's not a lot of malicious, bad things that could happen. We're just pointing people in the right direction, helping them find the information they're looking for and generally trying to be as helpful as possible. So that's all the agent is doing. We committed very early on. We're never going to sell someone's information to a third party. The only way we use information is to better serve that user and make better recommendations. But with tens of thousands of conversations happening over the course of a day, four or five people certainly can't intervene everywhere. I'm just wondering really at the core of it how mad someone gets. Do they just go, ah, it's AI, I know it makes mistakes, and they move on, or do they get really angry? We've seen some people get frustrated. That was early on. We fixed a lot of those problems that were frustrating people. As you can imagine, I think the most frustrated and angry people I've seen in the early first couple months of our platform launch was when the AI, you know, they were looking for hotels and it kept asking them about flights over and over. That's a classic thing like this stupid chat bot doesn't work. Like I knew this wasn't always cracked up to be. We've really fixed all of those problems, so it's not going to like keep banging its head against a wall if it's like going in the wrong direction anymore. But I think on the other side of things, what I had never seen or experienced myself was just expressing gratitude, knowing that they're chatting with an AI and saying, thank you so much. This is so incredible. Like, when's the last time you ever said that to like a chat bot that you knew is non-human? I know I had never said that, but we're seeing that on a daily basis. Thousands of people saying, thank you. This is so incredible. I'll be back. And it says, let me know if you have any other travel questions. People are like, I will. Like, so <laughs> seeing that kind of enthusiasm in a positive direction has been just as surprising, honestly. So far, you've got Guide Geek on WhatsApp and Instagram. What else is in the works? We will be launching Facebook Messenger soon. That's built. So we're just testing it. And then the website integration is already live. So if you go to matadornetwork.com, you can just start chatting with the Guide Geek AI immediately on our website. It's just bottom right corner. It will pop up and tell you what it is. And then you start typing your message. And we're seeing actually a lot of usership off of our website. So 
that's encouraging. And all of these things will come out of the box for DMOs. So if we work with a DMO, they will also, we'll just give them a small snippet of code and they can have the AI live on their website as well. They can connect it to their Instagram account. Soon they'll be able to connect it to their Facebook if they so choose. Sort of platform ubiquity is what we're going after here. And is the pricing based on use or is it a flat fee or a combination? It's a flat fee. We have different pricing for different size DMOs. We have a couple countries that we're launching with. So those are larger programs and licenses than the small towns that we're launching with. And then we have a couple U.S. states. So DMOs of all sizes, depending on the size of the DMO. But, you know, we don't want to make this expensive. I think it's very affordable. And then as our partners start using it as one of their key platforms, I think there will be more opportunities to partner. We've gotten really good at making content to promote our AI and then distributing that on social So I think we'll bring some of those learnings to DMOs and help them get more users for their own AI as it continues to develop. And you're in how many languages? 45. It's incredible. Like to see it effortlessly flowing in Hebrew, Bengali, and obviously tons of Spanish, French, Portuguese, Mandarin, Japanese. And Matador has a 700 person influencer team. Many of them are foreign nationals who have built huge followings on social and they're travel influencers in China or Brazil or Australia. Or And so many of them obviously speak another language as their first language. And we ask them, like, how is it in Mandarin? And they're like, it's very articulate. It speaks very well. It's incredible. How do consumers find out about GuideGeek? Yeah, just go to guidegeek.com. You'll see the rest from there. You can scan the QR code. It's free. You don't have to register for anything. It's not in the app store. A lot of people are like, I can't find the app. It's not an app. So just go to guidegeek.com and you can connect instantly. You know, and I can answer that question, actually, having built a lot of apps myself, and I know that Ross is going to back me up on this. It's a common question you get from people is, why don't we build an app for that? First of all, you got to get people to download it. And then secondly, you have to get people to use it. And then thirdly, you got to get people to keep it. It's a very expensive process. There's a lot of churn. And with people already on these platforms like WhatsApp and Instagram, what's the point? Those are all very valid, and I would agree with all those, Mark. The last one that's a big one is that this technology is moving so fast. We are rapidly iterating on it and adding new features. And if you are in an App Store environment, the App Store or Android, you need to resubmit your app every time you ship new code. It's a total nightmare of like how many times you'd have to resubmit the app for consideration to Apple, for instance, for iOS, to the App Store. And so we want to iterate fast. As the AI gets better, we want our technology to instantly get better. So yeah, for a number of reasons, we just like forget the app. Let's just let this thing run wild. Well, I'm personally very excited about your product, Ross, and I wish you the best of luck. Thanks for appearing on the podcast with me. Thanks, Mark. It's been fun. Take care. And that's Brand USA Talks Travel. I'm Mark Lapidus. Thanks for listening. Your feedback is welcome. Email us at podcast at thebrandusa.com or call 202-793-6256. Brand USA Talks Travel is produced by Asher Mirovich, who also composes music and sound. Engineering by Brian Watkins. With extra help from Bernie Lucas, Danze Karaoke, and Casey D'Ambra. Please share this podcast with your friends in the travel industry. You may also enjoy many of our archived episodes, which you can find on your favorite podcast platform. Safe travels.